we're here to talk about micro C and how it um, enables us to really break the high C resolution barrier. Not only that, it provides a kind of um, a major boost to the contact matrices that you can build and actually has quite a bit of cost savings associated with the higher signal to noise, but we'll spend the next hour going through um, high level detail and all of that. Before we really jump in to uh, today's webinar, I wanna highlight that we have a sort of adjacent, uh, it's not really a webinar series, but it's a Ask the Expert series where we'll be bringing in various people um, within the Dovetail or Cantata organization to really kind of do deep dives into the Dovetail assays that make up the Cantata proximity ligation portfolio. And so the first one actually pairs very nicely with this. This is going to be the micro C from benchtop to terminal. And this is really going to walk us through uh, the, the actual what it takes to make a micro C library. And then also walks you through sort of the introductory uh, computation of really how to QC um, micro C data. And the, the structure of these sort of uh, Ask the Experts webinar are split 50-50 between a walkthrough presentation and then it's going to be open up to Q and A, so you can get into all the nitty gritty details and put push, push, poke, and prod at whatever you want to, and we'll have the the correct people there to answer those. Um, that being said, don't hesitate to answer questions in today's webinar through the Q and A, as Sierra mentioned. Um, but there's there's also going to be a follow up to this to really get into um, the bones of of micro C. So today, what we're going to talk about is um, obviously micro C, but we're going to do a brief introduction into genomic interactions and chromatin conformation. Basically, how we go from a linear view of the genome to a three-dimensional view of the genome. Then we're going to kind of put this into action uh, with a very short case study on how micro C can really help us understand uh, the MIC-associated transcription machinery. And we'll, we'll talk about why that's important to understand. And then finally, we'll, we'll go over micro C, what, what the actual concept of it is, the improvements that it has over traditional high C, and then we'll, we'll touch on some frequently asked questions around micro C. Um, so let's get into this. So one of the things that we do know is that the genome isn't organized in this nice straight line, right? When you visualize stuff on, uh, uh, IGV, right, or when you're making your track plots of ChIP-seq data and ATAC data, it's it's a very linear view of genome. But we know that that's not the case, right? We have three meters of DNA that's all folded into a nucleus, and that's done in a hierarchical, very structured manner. And so really the goal of um, uh, genomic interactions is to really help us understand what the functionality is of having certain things positioned in the genome where they are. So taking us from this linear view to this three-dimensional view. So not only do they provide us this three-dimensional view, but they have uh, genomic interactions are an incredibly high value data type. They can serve many, many functions and fit into many applications. From the standard chromatin confirmation, uh, which is kind of what uh, traditional HICE goes after, the AB compartments, TADs, and things like that. Then we can get into gene regulation, really looking at the, the machinery of how a gene is turned on and off in three-dimensional space. Then the other uh, applications in which it's really useful is in um, SNP annotation. You have SNPs that occur in dark matter of the genome and you need to know what promoter they go to. Well, you now have, uh, through these genomic interactions, a means by which to say, this SNP is contacting this promoter, maybe not the nearest neighbor promoter. Right? It's, it's a physical piece of evidence that helps us link things in the genome. The other thing that these links provide is the ability to do telomere to telomere haplotype phasing. So when we get these links, they usually come from the same strand and you, you have SNPs on, on one side of the interaction, SNPs on the other side. Um, you know that they're, they're linked together on the same um, uh, parental uh, copy, right? So we can take this linkage information to span uh, the centromere and basically phase uh, telomere to telomere with really complete phase blocks. The other thing that it's really powerful for is structural variation, uh, particularly in translocations, where you can see a 
you know, parts of chromosomes being cut and moved onto others, it's really easy to see in a contact matrix where these things occur. So, but the thing that we're going to really focus in on today is gene regulation. And so, a lot of the research that's been done with CHIP and ATAC has really, you know, elevated our understanding of how genes are regulated, how they're turned on and off. We know that it's quite complex. It involves both distal and proximal cis elements, right? And so you'll have your core promoter, you'll have, right, where RNA uh, uh, pole comes down, binds, and then elongates across the gene body. Then we have proximal regulatory um, features. And then we also have these distal elements that could be, you know, 10 kb, 100 kb, a megabase away, right? And when we start getting into those longer interactions, it can become really challenging to understand which enhancer is actually really responsible or which silencer is really responsible for driving the gene expression profiles that we see. And so we capture this information through these genomic interactions, right, where we build these loops. And this loop that you're looking at here is kind of a standard cartoon version of, of a loop where you, again, have your promoter, you have pole 2 bound, then you have your distal enhancer and your transcription factors that have been re, uh, that are in place to recruit pole 2 But it's not always this simple. Um, the regulatory landscape is quite complex, and DNA folding is very dynamic, right? So between different cell types, you're going to have different folding patterns. Um, and so you can often have the situation arrive where you can have several re regulatory elements. These are the uh, colored boxes here on our uh, linear view of the genome. And here's the promoter. And if this promoter is kicked on, you want to understand which one of these um, factors is really the thing that's driving that gene expression. So is it A, is it B, is it C? And the result between these different um, interactions are, are a very different folding pattern in the genome. And so um, proximity ligation um, or micro C, high chip, things like that are ways by which we can capture the correct folding information to tell you it's factor A or factor B or factor C. Now in real life, this sort of um, factor hopping uh, happens quite frequently. So here's just an example where we're looking at um, a a wild type in a treatment control or a treatment of um, uh, of a mouse model that has been um, impact or has been treated to impact acetylation activity. What we can actually see here between the acetylation um, coverage, this is uh, Chipsy, is that we can see that the the actual patterns of where uh, H3K27 uh, has been acetylated is quite similar between the two. But what we see between these, these two uh, samples is that the uh, interactions between them are quite different. And one thing to call out here is the growth hor hormone uh, producer uh, uh, promoter here. And the wild type doesn't really have any interactions associated with it. Well, in the treatment, we actually see that it has a, a link with this enhancer region um, all the way over here. So it hops the two nearest um, enhancer marks to, to engage with this one um, uh, downstream of the promoter. So let's put this into action when we are thinking about um, MIC, for example. Um, MIC is a key gene that is a regulator of gene transcription. So the protein that's encoded by the MIC, um, the MIC gene is really vital in mediating gene transcription um, globally across the genome. And MIC is often found to be dysregulated in many, many cancers. So here what we're showing um, on this really great uh, review paper is going over where we see MIC um, uh, dysregulation in various cancers um, and what percentage of the uh, uh, switches uh, associated with uh, key oncogenes we see associated with the MIC gene. But these, these dys dysregulations can be a function of either amplification, right, gene copy, 
translocation where it's being put into an entirely different uh, regulatory uh, mechanism on a different chromosome. Enhancer hijacking, where it's going and skipping a couple uh, enhancers and talking to something else that it normally wouldn't see, or ab aberrant signaling pathways. And this leads to um, initiated tumor growth or sustained tumor growth. And so what we're going to do in the next couple slides is really try to understand what the transcriptional mechanisms are uh, in MIC or for MIC in just a standard GM12878 cell. So that way, when we know what its kind of basal form is, we can then understand in an oncogenic scenario what may be driving the, the gene expression of MIC. So first, we're going to take a look at AB compartments. And AB compartments are reflective of chromatin state. So an A compartment is open, it's active. So if you think about ATAC-seq, you're going to see a lot of ATAC signal there. B compartments are closed heterochromatin. Um, so if you think about it again from an ATAC perspective, it's going to be a very, uh, very low flat coverage because there's no place for TN5 to really get in that cut. And so the, the thing that we're going to ask here is what does on chromosome 8, what does the compart um, compartment structure look like? And what compartment does MIC uh, fall into? And so here what we're looking at is an interaction frequency across the um, across the length of chromosome 8. So the diagonal here is chromosome 8. And the darker squares mean that uh, these regions of, of the genome are interacting very heavily. The lighter regions mean that the corresponding um, vector is not interacting highly. So if we take this box, for example, is interacting highly with itself, that makes sense. Um, then we go over here, we see it's not interacting at all. So these two things in physical space cluster apart from each other. And then uh, we see maybe an increase in interaction here, and then it goes out as we uh, move away. And we can see this interaction uh, or this compartment structure across the whole length of the chromosome. So we could go all the way out here um, into the Q-arm, and we can see that this region here is actually uh, really engaged with this part here. And so then what we can do is take an eigenvector um, of that AB compartment score and plot it. And so anything below zero is a B compartment, again, heterochromatin, and anything in an A compartment is open active chrom uh, chromatin. And so what we can see, there's clearly switches between open and closed chromatin throughout chromosome eight, which there should be, that's kind of standard um, uh, chromatin dynamics. And then if we go all the way across to where uh, MIC occurs, we see that it occurs in a very small A compartment um, right here. So it's in the active, it's in an active compartment and should be transcribed. That's cool. That tells us a little bit about whether or not it's gonna be in an active chromosin state or closed chromosin state, but there's still more to dive into in terms of the, um, the, the mechanisms behind MIC transcription. So let's do that. So we can zoom in on the, uh, the tail end of the Q arm and start looking at TAD structure. Now, TADs are topologically associating domains. These are usually linked function genes that all kind of cluster together in three dimensional space. And so, if we zoom into that cluster, we can see various types of, of folding where um, we can have very large clusters that are broken up into subclusters, um, or we can have areas that are kind of maybe lacking in interaction. So, what we're going to ask is what are the topological structures associated with MIC? So what we're going to do is we're going to take our microSU data, data here that tells us what part of the genome is interacting with another part. And then we're going to call uh, TADS at two different resolutions, 25 KB and 10 KB resolution, and then plot those TAD blocks out um, underneath the, the matrix. And what we can see is that where MIC is right here occurs in a larger TAD structure um, that is con that consists of at least three subtads. You could probably convince yourself that there's a fourth subtad uh, structure there, but really what we we know from this image is it sits in a hierarchical chromatin folding structure, right? Where there's very clear compartments um, that are broken up by usually CTCF uh, mediated events. Cool. So we now know that it sits in an A compartment. We now know that it sits within a hierarchical cluster of, of linked function uh, genes. So what else can we get from this? 
the next thing that we can do is call loops, these chromatin loops where there's strong interactions uh, between uh, two loci. So if we go back to this image here, wherever you see a very bright punctate spot in the matrix, that indicates that there is a, a strong interaction between uh, two loci that are separated by a large linear distance. Now, these, so that means that, well, you know, this thing may be a couple, you know, 100 k, uh, KB apart, right? Or maybe 50 KB apart in linear space, they're, or in, in three dimensional space, they're right next to each other. So we can go through and call those dots or those loops from the contact matrix. And so the questions that we're gonna ask here when we're doing this sort of loop calling experiment is, are there chromatin loops associated with MIC, right? It's a very simple question to ask. And then what we want to do is really understand what are these loops actually doing? What are the regions that, um, that are linked with MIC? And so what we can do is we typically call loops at several resolutions. Um, here we did it at uh, 5KB and 2KB resolution, and we can see there's, very, there's four distinct loops that are being called um, associated with MIC. Here's the MIC chain. When we go across again, here is the reference chain. I'm on the diagonal. There's a loop here, a loop here, a loop here, and one way out here. So that's cool. We know where the loops are, but we don't really have enough information with just the loops alone to really tell you what it's doing or what it's engaged with. So to answer that particular part of the question, we need to pull in additional data. So now we'll go pull in our RNA-seq and our chip-seq data for promoters, enhancers, and uh, transcriptions of poll activity. And so um, all I'm simply doing here is plotting the mic micro-C matrix along with the TADs. We're looking at the RNA signal. So again, RNA or, or the, the MIC is expressed here. Then we're looking at the uh, promoter regions or the active promoter regions. So we see that there are two active promoters in this region. Here we see a, um, a kind of cluster of enhancer activity. Right, so there's a lot of um, H3K27 acetylation that's happening within this region. And we see that pole two is in fact bound to the MIC promoter and is elongating both the gene. So now what we want to understand is what are these loops doing, right? What are they linking? And what we can see here is if we go through and walk across, we see that okay, it's the the promoter is in touch with is in touch with this enhancer and this enhancer as well as this enhancer mark. So all we're really doing is going up, drawing a line, and coming right back down. Going up from MIC, drawing a line, and coming right back down. So we can clearly see what it's engaged with. There are more informatic uh, savvy ways to do this, which is actually where I've actually been able to annotate, where you just simply intercept the loop anchors uh, with, your, uh, with your enhancer sites. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually a pretty, it's a bed tools intersect um, function. One thing that is interesting is this loop down here, this loop anchor here is not really uh, associated with any factor. So we might want to pull in, say, CTCF uh, chip data to see if this is involved with a chromatin boundary or something like that. So we can go from the very large scale, uh, the whole length of the chromosome, and talk about whether or not MIC is associated with a open or closed compartment. Then we can go in and see what, what the hierarchical structure is associated with MIC. Then we can call very specific interactions that are linked with the MIC promoter, and then incorporating or integrating other data types with the, the loop calls from the micro C data, we can now annotate what enhancers are engaged with MIC to help drive gene expression. Maybe what you want to do next is go through and maybe try to delete out those regions that encode for those particular answers and see what the impact on um, the uh, on the expression of MIC looks like. Um, the other thing that, that you can now think of is now I know what enhancers are typically engaged with MIC. So now if I see a different enhancer promoter interaction profile, maybe it's it's something to investigate further in terms of oncogenesis. So that's just a very brief case study in how I can take micro C data and kind of walk all the way down the line to get really nice enhancer promoter 
um, uh, annotation and details around what, what's driving the MEC transcription. All right, now we're just gonna do a, an overview of MicroC. I just showed you one, why proximity ligation and 3D genomic data is important and how it can be used. Showed you a case study of how MicroC can really help us understand the transcriptional landscape of, of a particular gene or genome wide. Um, and now let's kind of talk about why micro C is the right approach to, to do that. So at the core of the of Cantata's dovetail um, proximity ligation portfolio is proximity ligation. Now this is, if you've done high C before, if you've done high chip before, 3C, 4C, this should look familiar to you. We don't do anything crazy. We start with cross-linked cells. This preserves the native 3D genomic interactions. Then what we do is we fragment, and this is where um, Dovetail kind of separates itself from traditional IC uh, approaches because we don't use restriction enzymes. And we'll, we'll talk about that quite a bit here in a few minutes. And the, our ability to use something like MNAs really sets micro C apart from any other approach to high C that there is. And so once we have these fragments, then we do proximity ligation, just as you would normally do proximity ligation. We clean uh, the, the DNA of those crosslinks, and then we convert um, the ligated molecules into a library. One thing to point out here, there's no sharing involved. All the, the, the fragments are so small and so uniformly distributed across the genome that we don't need to shear. And what that also does for us is it reduces a lot of the noise signal that's introduced in high C. So um, there's two points where, where noise is introduced into uh, restriction enzyme-based high C. One is the restriction enzyme itself. You'll, you'll, uh, I'll show you where you stack your reads and bias your data towards um, uh, restriction enzyme motifs. And then in the second is when you sonicate, you introduce a lot of invalid high C pairs that things like Juicer, high c Pro calls as invalid because they're not informative of topology. But with standard high c you have to shear because your molecule lengths are so variable and you have to get that thing down into an 800 to 300 uh, base pair fragment to put on a sequencer. And so if you have a 1 kb and a 500 base fragment that have ligated together, that's 1.5 kb. You have to shear that if you want to include that into your library. So Really, we're doing proximity ligation. We're just doing a proximity ligation that's really dialed in to capture the building block of chromatin, which is the nucleosome, right? When we think about how chromatin behaves, we really want to focus on nucleosome position, right? And what, what those things are actually engaged with. And so here is just a, a kind of schematic. This is the concept of micro C which is you have nucleosomes fairly uniformly distributed across the genome, right? And then we fragment there. So all of our coverage profile falls where nucleosomes are, are, are occupying that space. Then what we can do is we can build fragment, or when we, when we fragment, this is the fragment size. They're all mostly mononucleosome side, maybe a little bit of linker DNA here and there. Um, but we get a very uniform fragment size throughout the genome. And then we're doing proximity ligation. So this, this sort of hodgepodge of, of interactions, these are all of the possible interactions that micro C can capture. As you can see, it's a lot. And they range from very short. So um, uh, N plus one, N plus two, N plus three, we could capture those interactions very readily, but we can also capture these super long interactions as well. So you're like, okay, that's a cool concept. So, but how is that really different? Okay. This is how it's really different from, from high C. So if we take a look here, you can do, uh, I've kind of uh, put where restriction uh, sites occur, restriction enzymes uh, motifs are. And they're color coded, so they can either, you could either have a single restriction enzyme or you could have multiple restriction enzymes to go in and fragment. And so what we can see between um, the restriction enzyme base versus the, the MNAs base, we see that the fragment size is actually quite variable. 
um, between the two. You're going to get some really short ones, and then you're going to get some long ones. And that sort of um, fragment size distribution is uh, even more exaggerated when you look at single restriction things like base type C, right, where you have these super long fragments. Then if you look at the coverage, you can see that what you're going to do, and I'll, uh, I have data, real, not schematic data, but real data to show this, is that you're really stacking a lot of your data where the restriction ends on, uh, restriction motif sites are. Then when it comes to proximity allegation, what you're really asking is where do these ends interact? And so you can capture this interaction, but you're not going to see close by. Um, you're going to capture this interaction, you're going to capture this one and this one, but you're not going to see anything where there's not motifs. You just can't capture that because there's no place to stack reads. This is really, really bad when it comes to single uh, restriction enzyme high C. You can improve it by adding more restriction enzymes, no doubt about that, but you're still never going to get the same type of uniform distribution or the possible interaction. So if you look at the possible interactions that you can get here, they're significantly less than a multiple restriction and even way, way reduced compared to a micro C style approach. Okay, concept is great. What does this mean for you, right? Why is this actually better? So let's talk about that. Let's think about what it would take to loop call, right? Just a, a standard loop calling experiment on a single sample. What do you need? Well, to, and from a planning standpoint, you need to book about two days for micro C. For the other approaches, it's going to be three to five days, depending on how long you want to, uh, what protocol you're following, how long you want to span it out, and what your uh, library conversion looks like at the end. What's your input? Well, because micro C has all of this, let me go back one, has this uniform distribution, the library complexity is way higher than any of these others because you're going to have gaps in coverage, so you're going to start accumulating PCR dupes more quickly, right? So we only need about 1 million cells to do this because we have such a high complexity library. We include so much more of the genome. With multiple and single restriction enzyme approaches, you're going to need 2 to 10 million cells to generate enough proximity ligated DNA. From there, what do you actually need to do to actually generate the libraries? Well, with micro C, you only need to do one proximity ligation. With the other approaches, you'll need to do somewhere between three to four proximity ligation reactions to get enough DNA uh, needed to generate the libraries to overcome complexity. So with micro C, we can take that one proximity ligation reactions and split that across three libraries. With multiple, you're going to split that across six. With single restriction enzyme high C, it's going to be eight. But you really have to parse these things out because you really want to minimize the PCR dupes. Sequencing is the most expensive part of this experiment, hands down, right? So you want to maximize the amount of return you get on the sequencer, right? And so this is how you do it. You make a lot of DNA and you split that across libraries. Because uh, micro C is so complex you don't and has, has a higher signal to noise, you don't need as many libraries to minimize your PCR duplicates. So with that being said, you only need to sequence to about 800 million reads to do loop calling applications, where with uh, multiple restriction enzyme high seeds, it's about 1.2 billion. With single, it's going to be about 1.6 billion. You need to sequence really deeply. So what does that cost you, right? So if I do one versus three versus four proximity ligations at list price, about, you know, it's under 500 bucks for a micro C library or uh, proximity ligation reaction. You're going to be multiplying that by three for multiple restriction enzyme and by four uh, for a uh, single restriction enzyme high C. Then library generation, well, we're only going to need three, assume 50 bucks for library conversion, maybe 24, uh, depending on what, again, what you're using. But this is going to be 150 bucks versus um, 300 versus 400. And then sequencing, this is where kind of the rubber meets the road. Because we're only sequencing 800 million read pairs, if you're doing just for this use case, a NovaSeq 600 uh, SP 300 cycle, it's about six, uh, 6,600 bucks for 1.6 billion reads. So we only would need to sequence half of that for micro C. So you're only spending $3,300, where with the other approaches, you're going to be using most of that flow cell. Uh, to get the data needed to loop call. So the total cost, you're coming in at under $4,000 to loop call on a sample where you're going to be, you know, closing in on almost a full NovaSeq lane or a NovaSeq lane plus 
quite a bit more, almost 10K to do a single restriction enzyme high C. Now, with this reduced sequencing and reduced cost, you're not sacrificing anything on discovery rate. So I can call TADS at 5 and 10 KB and loops at 5 and 10 KB. And what you can see here is that the, the discovery rate for these features is significantly higher at any given resolution with lower sequencing than, than any other approach, right? So loops at 10 KB, we're getting 3,500, right? We're, or sorry, uh, TADS, 3,500, 3,500, 2,000. TADS has kind of like a, a, a minimal resolution, so they're really easy to pick up. Now, when we get into loops, if I call loops at 5 KB with micro C, we're at over 8,500, where you're not even touching 5,000, 5, or uh, you're not even touching 2,000 the single restriction enzyme high C. And this carries through at, at 10 KB as well. Now, this is really apparent if you just look at the contact matrix quality. The micro C contact matrix quality is much more complete has fewer stripes and missing uh, gaps. Uh, multiple restriction enzyme has gaps. It looks better than single restriction enzyme, but it's still not the same. And you're gonna capture a lot more signal a lot more strongly than what you'd see with any other approach. And this manifests itself in the loop calls. You are going to see a lot more loops than with micro C than you're gonna see with any other approach. So let's look at the, the matrix detail. Um, uh, in a bit more in depth, right? So if I take just two um, two regions of the genome and I look at loops that have been previously called by that Rao et al., you know, they did three point some odd billion reads with high C. Um, that's kind of been the, the truth set. So we can go in and look at what is the read support? How many contacts are observed at these loops that were been called in the route out paper between micro C, multiple, and single restriction enzyme high C? What we can see is across the board, micro C has stronger read support, right? More contact support than any other approach. Not only that, but the matrices look better. They look more complete, and we can see more features. I particularly like uh, this uh, snapshot here because when you look, there's clearly loops that aren't being identified um, in, the, in the restriction enzyme data sets. You maybe, if you squint your eyes, you can convince yourself that there's an interaction here, um, but you're not, you're missing some stuff down here. You're not seeing a bright punctate spot here or here. Um, you kind of see a spot here. And in the single restriction enzyme spot, the inter-TAD dynamics are almost completely lost. You just don't have the resolution or coverage to be able to really see any of the features that are associated with, um, with these loops. So it's a pound for pound or, or sequence per, for sequence, micro C packs a heavier punch in contact matrix building. And therefore that, that trickles down through all of the feature calling and applications that you want to apply these genomic interaction data sets to. Um, here's just a bar plot summarizing the TAD and loop calls at different resolutions. You'll see micro C is calling more TADs and more loops um, at, at a fixed resolution uh, with less data, right? So for less data off the sequencer, your discovery rate is actually higher. So why is that? So we talked quite a bit about what the coverage profile looks like and the type of interactions you can see. But the other thing that I touched on was about the number of useful reads in library complexity. So if we just look at the total library, how many reads are considered valid? Well, a valid read is a um, cis read where the insert size is greater than the, than the molecule. So say you have a 300 base molecule that's been, um, that has a proximity ligation junction. Well, if, you're, if that spans 10 KB, if that junction spans 10 KB, so the insert 10 KB, your molecule was 300, that's a valid proximity ligation reaction or, or interaction or pair. And uh, transreads are also considered by these uh, sort of uh, high C processors as valid reads. They're, they're just a different class, right? And so if I ask that question, right, how many of, what percentage of the total library of the useful reads are, are valid. We get over 90% of our reads. And we actually see a lot of customers in the 94 to 95% of, of the reads actually come back as high quality, 
topology informative rates. Super cool. Not only that, but when we look at the breakdown of the insert size, right, are we capturing a lot of stuff in the short range and in the intermediate range or the super long range? Micro C is enriched in all of those interactions um, compared to the other approaches. The last one is complexity, right? As I mentioned, the, the nucleosome is pretty uniformly distributed across the genome, right? So our complexity is always going to be higher because we are not stacking reads at motifs that are that are fixed in the genome. So again, pound per pound, you get more off the sequence of RIF-microC than any other thing out there. So what I showed you earlier was that schematic of, of the coverage and, and what that really looks like. And so here's what the, the data actually tells us. So if we aggregate the coverage signal around, say, CTCFs, we can see that microC is able to position and phase nucleosomes um, relative to CTCF, where you're not going to see any sort of uh, biological feature when you aggregate around that. You're basically asking, where are the res restriction motifs in reference to a CTCF when you aggregate that signal? Now, if I just plot a track, right? This is data straight out of IGB. Um, you can plot and you can see that where micro C has very uniform coverage, you might have a little gap here and there uh, for where a nucleosome isn't, um, but we, we do retain quite a bit of coverage off the genome and it's fairly uniform. Whereas with multiple restriction enzyme, we start to see larger gaps, larger dips. We see places of over enrichment and clear places of under enrichment. And that is even further exaggerated in single restriction enzyme IC, where you see a lot of stacking at restriction sites and very large gaps in restriction site deserts. So no matter how much sequencing you do, you will never be able to recover this particular section in a matrix. You have to have reads that fall into this region in order to incorporate it into any sort of confirmation analysis. And with a gap like this, you're just never gonna be able to cover it. So the uniform distribution of nucleosomes really helps us cover more of that genome as well as increases our signal to noise. Now, if we were to take this particular image and turn this into a contact matrix, we can see that micro C enables us to phase nucleosomes, not only in linear space, but in that three-dimensional space and contact matrices, where we can see that, say, CT, C, C, blah, 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 sorry, CTCF is a boundary to uh, interactions. And so we see nucleosome uh, plus, N plus one from the CTCF interacting with uh, N plus two, N plus three, N plus four. Super cool. And we see very little interaction going across that CTCF boundary. Now you can kind of see that CTC's CTCF boundary I need more coffee apparently, or maybe less coffee. Either way, um, we can kind of see that there is a boundary there, um, but you kind of have to squint and convince yourself that it's there, um, but you're not really seeing any biology when we take a look at this. I should note that these uh, matrices are aggregated at a one base pair resolution. Um, so this is the highest resolution you could possibly build these aggregates on, and you can clearly see that we're capturing the native biology of the cell where uh, with the restriction enzyme, you're not really capturing the chromatin dynamics, you're capturing restriction enzyme uh, motif dynamics is really what you're capturing. And so as I did earlier with MIC, you can really easily integrate the micro C matrices and the features associated with those matrices like loops with all of your chip and ATAC and RNA data that you have um, previously generated to really link particular promoters um, to enhancers uh, that may be driving their expression. So it, it's a really powerful way to annotate those enhancer promoter interactions at a significantly reduced cost compared to other high C approaches. Um, I'm, I'm done with the, the main bulk. I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about the FAQs associated with this. I haven't had a chance to look at the Q&A yet, but I suspect that we're going to see a few of these uh, questions get addressed in the next couple of slides. So the first question that often comes up, and, um, and I think somewhat rightly so, is how do you compute these data? Uh, th there are some open source tools that really rely on restriction enzymes to, to do the sort of primary data processing, which is going from your BAM file, or sorry, your FASTQ into your contact matrix. And, and there's some other tools out there 
that help call features out of those, those matrices. But how do you do that when there's no restrictions on it? It's actually a lot easier. We at Dovetail have uh, developed what's called an EpiPipe, or not a EpiPipe, we just call it EpiPipe. Um, it's, the, it's the workflow that we've used to really analyze micro C data. It's taking 40 nucleo um, standards, right? So we're not we're not in doing magic here. I will say this is this, there's no magic involved here. Um, and all what you really need to know from a micro C data set is what are the uniquely mapped reads. That's it. That's all you need to know. From there, and, and we do that through taking our FASTQ files, sending them through BWAMM, sending that through pair tools, um, and then what we get out of that is a BAM file and a pairs file. Right, and that pairs file you just plug right into a matrix generator like Juicer or Cooler, um, and then you can do very standard high C analyses like call tabs, call loops, right? Do A B compartments, um, or you can do very micro C specific things like call loops with a tool that was designed to look at micro C data like Mustache, um, or look at nucleosome positioning by just converting it into a big wig. Right and plotting that that linear coverage. So we're just we're again not doing any magic. All we want to know is what are the uniquely mapped read pairs and feed that through uh, the system. Those things like HiC Pro and uh, Juicer uh, Juicebox, what they do is they take those uniquely mapped pairs and then there's a series of very complex questions that they're asking of the, of the data, which is where where are the restriction motifs in in the data or in, uh, in reference to the alignment. Is that motif within the, the average library molecule size or outside of that? And then is it a circularized molecule? Is it a dangling end molecule? Or is it a true ligated molecule, right? And those, those, um, those black box tools are phenomenal for processing high C data. Don't get me wrong, they're great tools. But when it comes to micro C data, a lot of those caveats that you have to think about whether or not your molecule's useful or not go completely out the window. You just need the uniquely mapped pairs. That's it. That's all you need. Um, and then everything else falls out from there. So it actually reduces the vast majority of the complexity in computing high C data. So if you're going the service route with us and, and sending your samples to us to pipette and generate the data, this is what we give you back. These are the deliverables associated with the, the EpiPipe run. If you want to do it yourself, we have these great read the doc tutorials. You know, it's like you could fish for someone, you could teach them how to fish, or you could teach somebody to teach themselves to fish. Um, our, our approach is to, to teach people how to teach themselves, right? And so these are very, very detail oriented walkthroughs with test data that walks you through, you know, what you need to do to prep, um, to, to process these data. Do the alignment, do the pair generation. How do you QC, generate the contact matrix and feature call? Do it, how, do we, how do we call AB compartments, TADS loops, things like that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, these contain uh, test data, both very, very deeply sequenced, the same data that I used to make that, that MIC case study, as well as very small dummy data sets to help you set up the pipeline at a very low burden um, to you, a very low time burden to you. The next question that we, always, 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 always get is how does micro C data behave at nucleosome free regions or these NFRs? So if I bring up the schematic of what micro, the micro C concept is, people look at this and go, well, what happens there? That's a great question. It's a very fair question. So let's answer that question. Um, so let's look at the coverage. Let's just look at the linear coverage at places that we know, right, we should see gaps in nucleosome position. So we'll look at transcription start sites and we'll look at ATAC peaks and we'll aggregate the micro C coverage uh, profile around those. And if you look at the transcriptional start sites, you see boom, right before the transcription start site that the nucleosome goes away, which is supposed to, right? In actively transcribed genes, there's no nucleosome right at the N, N minus one of the, uh, of the transcription start site. So we see that, boom, perfect. Um, and then at the ATAC peak, we also see that uh, just upstream of that, we see a dip in that coverage. But let's look at the y-axis for a quick second. This is a very narrow window of the y-axis. If we actually plot the full range of the y-axis, we see a dip 
and then we see it continue. So on average, we're not actually losing signal. We can detect that that nucleosome isn't there, and we can detect the N plus one, plus two, plus three, yada, 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 down from that transcription start site. But it doesn't, we, we, on average, that coverage doesn't go to zero. And I can ask that question, what does the, what does the per base coverage look like in, um, in the genome? So I take the whole genome and plot, well, here's my per base coverage. This is what the, the distribution of coverage looks like, where X, uh, coverage in X is on the X conveniently, and number of bases divided by total bases in region um, is, in, is in the Y. And what we can see is we have a very normal distribution. In ATAC peaks, we actually have slightly higher coverage. We do see um, a maybe longer tail here going into the zero, but we do see coverage there. Um, and so that's, that's really good to see, actually. Finally, if you think about what this means for your contact map, think about what you're actually doing when you're building a contact map. You're building bins out of the genome. You can build it at 5 KB, 10 KB, or sorry, 10 KB, 5 KB, 1 KB, right? And so if I ask, what's the mean ATAC peak width? How many bases makes up an ATAC peak? On average, it's 790. Um, so when you bend at these resolutions, you're not really missing the, 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 the impact of the nucleosome-free region isn't really going to impact the coverage across the bend, which is really, really nice to see. Um, so that's kind of, that's, that's micro C behavior over nucleosome-free regions. The, one of the last big ones that we often come um, up against is the original micro C paper was, was really designed to look at chromatin fibers. Right, so these really short interactions that were that were kind of spanning this, you know, maybe zero to two KB region, and really looking at how nucleosomes, like a cluster of six to ten nucleosomes, are actually interacting with each other. Um, it was a phenomenal paper, um, but they realized that that was really only good for very short interactions. There are newer protocols like micro CXL that use different crosslinkers that really preserve that long range interaction and builds a much, much more robust matrix. So when you do the proximity ligation, you're capturing a lot of data. So as I showed you earlier, micro C captures more loops. Well, then the question is if, if micro C truly is only capturing the smaller interactions, right? Are these loops smaller? The answer is no. When we plot loop size, we see that they're almost the exact same size as micro C or as, as multi-restriction enzyme high C. And both of those are a little bit smaller than single restriction enzyme high C, but that's because the distance between single restriction enzymes becomes quite different, right? Um, as as you add more cut sites, you're gonna start seeing smaller things and you're actually gonna get closer, excuse me, to the truth. So we're capturing the same size of interaction. And so why is that? Remember that whole signal to noise thing where we're building very uniform fragment sizes to stack reads on? Well, what that means is that when we look at the contact decay over distance, so this is contact count, this is, uh, this is distance, and we look at how the reads play out. These are your, your invalid high C pairs from here to here. This is what those juicers or, or juice box and high C pro spit out as invalid, right? Then, once you get here, then you start getting into like the topology informative reads. So in invalid read space, micro C actually does better, has fewer invalid pairs. Um, and then when we look at, well, where's the mean tad size versus where's the mean loop size? What does the contact frequency looks, look like? And it is well above, oh, sorry about that, well above what you see with any restriction in um, high C. And so I'll end with the last two frequently asked questions, which or the last frequently asked question, which is um, why why would we do dovetail approaches over others? So hopefully all of those arguments around why micro C is what it is um, will will help you make that decision. But really, it comes down to we have more uniform genomic coverage than any other approach out there, so we can include more um, of the genome in the analysis, and there's more per base read support. We have an, an improved signal to noise um, of any other high C. So that means you can sequence 
a lot less and still see a lot more. So we're increasing our sensitivity, uh, sensitivity way above any other high C approach. And finally, we have superior accuracy, where the data from um, different approaches is going to be biased towards motif. So here we can see where data stacks up relative to a, a chip or a CTCF chip peak. And we can see that we're capturing that same signal within our data um, where the restriction enzyme based, you're capturing the restriction sites near that feature that you're wanting to. So if you're calling enhancer promoter loops, what you're really asking is what is the restriction site nearest to my promoter and what is that engage, what restriction site nearest to my enhancer am I engaged with? And when you have multiple things that are very close to each other, a shift of a few KB either way is actually going to make quite a bit of difference in what feature you're going to go after. Finally, um, micro C is really the backbone of Dovetail's confirmation assays. So it, that high signal to noise, low sequence cost gives us a very great platform to then go in and perform chromatin amino precipitation to get high chip, to get very targeted protein mediated views of topology. Or to the micro C library, you can add the pan promoter panel and really get very, very targeted views of promoters and what they're engaged with. Um, so it's a really cheap way to do enhancer promoter interactions from a sequencing standpoint. With that, I want to just remind everybody that there will be an Ask the Experts deep dive into micro C on March 9th. That's going to be led by Miriam, who is our head of uh, customer support. And it's a great place to, like I said, dive into the nitty gritty of what these assays are. And with that, with the next five minutes, man, I finished in five minutes. Um, well, I will take questions. Let me uh, turn off the laser pointer. I also want to say thank you to everybody for sticking with me um, through the hour. And now we'll get to some Q&A. All right. OK, the first question is, why don't the 5 KB resolution calls don't include 10 KB calls? It makes sense why you don't see the 10 KB and 5 KB. Um, yeah, so the, it's a good question. It, it's really a function kind of of the, the caller. What you will see a lot of times is um, the 5 KB uh, loops are a little bit smaller because the window that they're using to call those loops is slightly different. This is why we usually tell people to call loops at multiple resolutions. Um, the other thing that you will see is when you call at multiple resolutions, you might get a loop that's very, very similar, but shifted 5 KB or 10 KB in one direction, like the, the bend size. Um, and that's because the true interaction is actually much smaller. Uh, it's a much smaller than that 10 KB window. So when you reduce the window, you'll actually see a slight shifting closer to the truth um, in some of the same things that are in the same boundary. So typically what you then, what you get a, a loop set, you want to take a union where you're going plus or minus, you know, 1.5 of the bend size or 2.5 of the bend size to, to get a union set of those loops. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, okay, next question. Can you call loops with hiccups or other programs? Yeah, so that was in the FAQ. Yeah, we once you get it in the matrix, you can do whatever loop caller you want. No big deal. Um, I knew that question was going to come up. Uh, how do we know when we're actually calling loops or noise relative to the amount of contacts? Yeah, so you know, we don't own the math uh, for calling loops, um, but you can really. So, I guess this kind of goes back to the signal to noise thing. When you're looking at loops in a contact map, the noise, if you're using restriction enzyme based high C, the, the, the noise comes from the uh, restriction motif, right? And, and where it's actually engaged. There is a sort of, um, there's a Brownian motion noise associated with high C, right? And once, once you, after you fix, you get everything in solution, you do it, there's, there's some random collisions that are going to happen, right? Um, and those follow a very clear negative binomial decay where when you're really close to, uh, to the interaction, the signal is super high. And as you start going out in distance, the probability of a Brownian interaction to occur goes way, way, way down, almost to nothing. And so when you see strong signals out here, right away from the axis, 
that's not Brownian motion. And so the way you pick that out from the noise is you say, okay, I'm going to build a sliding window at this distance here, right? And say, okay, so this thing's like, uh, I don't know, 20 kb. Uh, yeah, it looks like that. Um, and say, okay, I'm going to take all the interactions that are 20 kb distance and say, what's the mean of those interactions? And say, does which ones are significantly different from the norms? That's one way to do it. There are several ways to do it, but that's really how you know that you're 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 not seeing that. Um, so uh, what what plotter do I use? I use a ton. I actually like picking new plotters all the time. Uh, it helps me understand how different tools work. Um, I, I will say I I did most of the computation for this. I I, I taught myself how to compute high C data and how to uh, do a lot of this work. And so this particular image that you're looking at here was with PyGenome tracks. The one with the MIC was done with a tool called Fancy. Um, there are a lot more tools that integrate high c data now. Um, uh, I've actually really gotten fond of the PyGenome tracks. It's one of the only ones that allows you to integrate the, the loop arcs as well as the contact matrix. Um, as well as all the big wigs in a single in a single image, uh, rather than have to kind of piece it across IGV or R or any of these other things. It's a really nice tool to do that. Okay, what is the read depth that you need for high for? I have that answer. Um, it is 800 million read pairs. Um, oh, I thought I had some. Yeah, uh, I had this. So uh, in this table here, walks through. Um, what, how much coverage is needed to do a particular um, function or a particular application like AB compartment stats, loops um, at various resolutions. So at 5, 10, 10 KB resolution, you need ADX coverage. So that is, oh, no. and it's that, um, the sensitivity of the mouse. Uh, so you, you need, you know, ADX coverage, uh, that's about, 266 million per gigabase of genome. So for the human genome, that's 800 million read pairs. So that's what you'd really need to do that work. As you really start to close that resolution, um, you, you'll need a lot more data to, to do that because you're working in three-dimensional space, right? So it's the it's kind of like the you're looking at the permutation of possible interactions uh, for a given bin size. Okay. Whether you have employed ng capture, see to, 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 to verify. Yeah, I actually I do have the capture data from Mick. I just I ran out of time to, to to make that plot, but it was in in the plan and it's there. Um, so yeah, I see Sierra's come back on, so I think we might be running low on time. You are at times. Sorry, Corey. Um, so we will go ahead and if if you're willing, Corey, I'll I'll let you follow up on some of these questions. Uh, actually, but what I was gonna say is I I have a couple extra minutes if folks want to stay on. Um, after you close out, I'm happy to, to go through a handful more questions and then whatever I don't get to. It's it's easier to talk through them than type through them. So I'm going to try to do great. it. That way. All right. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Corey, for your time. Uh, thank you all for joining and sticking with us again. Sounds like Corey's going to keep going here. Um, so I will join you all again next time. Thanks, Sierra. Okay. Um, answered that question. I've had low. So um, one of the questions came up around um, MNase digestion. We do have workflows to help. Um, we do have a standard workflow that works for most sample or for most cell types uh, for getting the digestion profile in the correct uh, size range to do this. Um, we also have some troubleshooting guides if if you have issues dialing that in. That is actually um, so. The the short answer is we have guides to do that. The probably better answer would be to attend the Ask the Experts uh, webinar here. Um, our customer support specialists are way better at this stuff than I am, so I don't wanna, wanna tell you the wrong thing here. Could you re-explain why splitting the library from proximity like Asian? Okay, yeah, this whole chestnut here. Why do, why do I need to make multiple libraries? Um, from a proximity ligation reaction. That's it. So the first thing is you need to understand how PCR duplicates occur. So if you have number of PCR duplicates on the Y, 
and your read depth on the X, it it kind of it, it ramps it ramps up and then it plateaus. So, or sorry, not PCR. This is the number of unique molecules. So as you start adding more sequence, you're getting unique molecules, unique molecules, unique molecules, and then you start to plateau, and then you really plateau. And so no matter how much you could you could take a standard NGS library, sequence the thing to 800 million read pairs, and you'd probably only retain about 250 million of those read pairs. So the way to get over this hurdle is to make separate libraries. And that way you know that as you start accumulating PCR dupes, it's from a unique set of molecules rather than sequencing that same pool of molecules. Um, so if you have one big pool of molecules and you sequence and you start plateauing, right, you don't know if that is a true PCR duplicate or if it's just the fact that you have so many cells and the probability that you have the same molecule in there occur, right? <clears throat> so if you split that out across multiple libraries, you know you know that the uniquely mapped reads are coming from a distinct pool of molecules that hasn't undergone any PCR yet. So that's the way that you know that the unique molecules split between the multiple libraries are, are unique and not just PCR dupes. Um, and so you could, you could take a single library and sequence it to 800 million read pairs, but you get diminishing returns. And then you also don't know if that duplicate is a true PCR duplicate or just a function of you have a million cells, and the prop, there's a possibility that you get the same interaction. Um, what are TADs? TADs are topologically associating domains. There's a lot of research out there uh, within this field, but it's simply this triangle structure here. That's a TAD. That's a, a, uh, a line of genome that's been... Sorry, I was going to get a... Uh, it's just basically like a rope of DNA that's kind of bundled about, right? And um, there's a lot of linked function genes in there, right? It's just a cluster of DNA that, that bundles together closely in three-dimensional space. And you can have clusters within clusters, and then you can have clusters that are close in three-dimensional space, but are also separated by a long string of DNA. Those would be your AP compartments. I got to, yeah, never mind. You answered my question. Yes. Um, So, uh, to, what's commonly used for resolution of calling tabs in the consumer? So, uh, resolutions for calling different features. Uh, there's no great answer for this. Uh, the question is, what are the common resolutions used to call tabs? I would say 25 KB, 10 KB, 5 KB. I would call it all those three and create a union set. Um, you, you could do it several different ways. You, you can just pick one and do that. Um, but as you can see in the MIC example, right, you, you want to be able to capture that hierarchy, hierarchical sub-tad structure. And if you just call it one resolution, you'll never see that. So we typically call it several. Um, and it also depends on the genome. Like if uh, you have a genome that doesn't have a lot of interaction, right, you may, you may, may need to zoom out farther, right? It's kind of like flying in a plane. You fly really high, you can see the whole mountain range, but it's really hard to pick out the house is on that mountain range. And if you fly really low and can see that house, you may be only able to see one or two mountain range, uh, mountains on either side of you and you'll miss seeing the whole range. So you want to do that at several resolutions um, to, to confirm what you're seeing. Okay, there is a cool question coming in about uh, how do you compare efficiency of loop calling from micro C to high chip, the pan promoter panel, uh, to understand the dynamics. Um, yeah, it's the 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 punchline here is that the the algorithms to call loops from a micro C data, from a high chip data, and from a pan promoter data set are different. You're asking fundamentally different questions of the data. Um, and so one of the one of the ways that you could think about efficiency is how much sequence do I need to call the feature that I'm looking for? Um, and if you're really looking for like enhancer promoter loops, it really makes sense to target the promoter. So for you know if you're doing high C, you'd sequence about 1.6 billion. 
uh, repairs and you see a handful of loops and a subset of those are gonna be enhanced promoted loops. If you do micro C, you do 800 million repairs and you'll see with something like mustache, like 10,000 loops um, at a given resolution. A handful of those are gonna be CTCF mediated. The other handful is gonna be enhanced promoter interactions. If you're doing the, um, the uh, hybrid capture, like a, the pan promoter style, you know that all of your interactions are anchored out of promoter, right? One end always is associated with promoter. Um, because of that, your sensitivity is really, really high. So you only need 200 million read pairs to call about 20, uh, 20 to 25,000 significant interactions. And you know that every single one of those interactions is linked to a promoter. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, so if you want to reach out to, to us, we can go into a bit more detail there. Um, it really, it, the assay that you pick really depends on the question that you want to know um, and what other data you have to input that. How low can we go with input material? Um, this is a fun and challenging question. The answer is that it uh, depends on what you want to do, right? If you want to call loops, you need 800 million repairs to kind of do that. And we know that it takes about a million cells to generate enough unique molecules to get that sequence step. So you can go lower, right? You can, you can go down to 10,000 cells, but you won't have the library complexity to call loops. Can you build a matrix? Yes. Will you be able to call AB compartments? Probably. Will you be able to call tens? I don't know, maybe at like 50, 100 KB resolution? But you won't. You're you're going to be really limited by the amount of unique molecules that that are in there. There there have been quite a bit of improvements in to um, uh, loop high sensitivity loop calling. Um, but if you actually look at the number of loops that they're reporting, it's pretty low. Like some of those single cell high C papers, they're talking loops in the in the hundreds, when we know that the loop should be in the like the tens of thousands, right? So, you know, it takes all that stuff with a grain of salt. If you're just wanting to see the, the contact matrix, yeah, you can do it. Um, the math becomes really challenging because the, the, the data landscape is very sparse. With that question, I do want to particularly call something out here. There's been a lot of buzz, and that buzz has gone up and down over the past several years about single cell high C. True single cell high C is almost impossible and not super informative because you're working in that um, sort of pairwise um, interaction space, right? It, it's, it's a permutational space. Per cell, per region, you can only capture one interaction, right? So for every bin, you can only get one read pair for that interaction that links it to something else. And we know that, you know, these interaction frequencies are quite high. And so if you reduce it down to the single cell, you're really reducing your ability to even, to even see stuff. And so the way around this, and this is what people have done, is they take a single cell um, other approach, like they'll do single cell methyl seek, and then they'll do uh, high C, and then what they'll do is they'll link the methyl reads on the high C, on the high C molecule to then bucket by population so it's never you you're you rarely ever truly see single cell high c what you see is single cell high c by proxy which is really just you you're either fact sorting to get a population or you're using something else to bucket the data into single population so you're never really doing single cell high c you're doing single population high c which is the equivalent of low input high c when it comes to resolution and things like that Um, why are we doing the pan promoter panel um, as the standard genome wide? So it's just, it's a different question, right? So with the, uh, let's see, okay. Why would you do the pan promoter panel instead of full genome wide micro C? A lot of it comes down to cost and what your question is. If you, if you are in entirely exploratory mode where you have no idea what gene or what feature it is that's going to be different between two samples, you should probably do whole genome micro C, right? Because you get the CADs, you get the AB compartments, you get the loops, um, and then you can you can determine what is the thing that you really want to focus in on. 
Well, if you already know that there's a handful of promoters or specific regions that you're looking at, there's no need to sequence 800 million read pairs to get the benefit of that interaction. You're, you can really target your interactions on your promoter. It's a, it's a different question, right? It's, a, it's just a different molecular biology question. Um, what we found is that high sequencing costs can often be a barrier to adopting proximity ligation, right? The days of like the 1.6 billion or 3 billion read pairs kind of put a lot of people off. You know, sequencing is not cheap. It's getting cheaper, hands down, for sure. But it's still, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money towards the experiment. And so what that does is it limits your ability to do replication. It limits your ability to expand the number of samples in a study to maybe get a robust signature. Um, so if we remove that sequencing burden by targeting promoters, which is the thing that people are mostly interested when you're looking at loops, it really reduces the sequence cost. But you don't get the TAD structure. You don't get the AB compartments. You're just getting the interaction. And so if you if you want the whole shebang, you've got to do micro C. But if you're really wanting to just target enhanced and promoter loops, why not just target the promoter? Um, and it saves you uh, about a quarter of sequencing of a micro C and almost 90% of the sequencing of what you do for high C. Can we get enough uh, resolution to look at contacts within single genes? And when you look at a single gene, do you observe the interaction with one nucleosome is gradually fading? Um, yes, the answer to this question is yes. You can just dial this stuff down to a single gene. You may need more data to see it at that resolution, um, but you can definitely do it. Um, there's been a few papers out now that have sequenced micro C data, like 3 billion read sets. Um, one of our customers actually just published one not too long ago is a, is a great paper. But you know those data sets are, are rich in information and you can really dial that kind of stuff in there. Uh, I covered the what feature of MNACE enables high resolution compared to high C. The only way to perform micro C is to buy your kit. Um, there are, there's one other, uh, so, we are the only commercial company that is offering micro C as a commercialized kit. Um, there are uh, homebrew approaches. The feedback that we've gotten from a lot of our customers is our approach is a lot easier to do um, and has a much higher success rate than people following the homebrew. Um, we have done a lot of optimization to really get the most out of the assay. Um, so, you know, and not only that is you also get customer support, right? With this homebrew, you're kind of shooting in the dark a lot of the time on where something failed, how something failed. We've done all the boundary testing. We know we, when something fails, which isn't that common, but when it does fail, um, we can help you, right? We, we've been there. We, we, we know what the pitfalls are. So, um, so that's something to, to keep in mind there. Uh, Do you ever run into a case where an enhancer, or you've run into a spot where enhancer spans two 5K bins? So even with micro C, do you recommend multiple resolutions? Yeah, um, I, I again, it's kind of like the, the that airplane analogy, right? You want to build a full picture. So even if you have a, a super large enhancer region, right? I would call it several resolutions because maybe there's a particular part of that enhancer region that's more engaged than the other, right? Um, so that's that's one one thing to kind of think about there is really building that full picture of chromatin confirmation. Um, I answered the analysis pipeline question. That's awesome. Um, uh, there's a question about normalization. Um, I won't go into detail about that here. There's a really great review paper, paper called um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to High C, and that goes into depth with a lot of the different normalization strategies. I'd, I'd check that out if I were you. Um, did you run an alignment tool to match the MIC? Did I run an alignment tool to match MIC transcriptional elements to confirmation? Uh, no, I had not done that, but I do have um, orthogonal data in the, the pan promoter and high chip data that, that, um, uh, that captures that. So the original micro C protocol has 3.5 to 3 million cells, but reducing the number of cells decreased library complexity. And no, actually, we found that it hasn't. Because we have, uh, we've really optimized the yield of the proximity ligation, 
um, we find that one million cells and three libraries is plenty to do this work. Um, you could you could probably even sequence them deeper if you wanted to. Um, have you measured the reproducibility reproducibility of TAD calls and different replicates? Um, I've done that with the pan promoter panel for loops, and the reproducibility is crazy high. Um, uh, we do find that reproducibility in general in the high C field is a function of sequencing depth. Um, there are a number of other papers that have looked at that reproducibility. I, I recommend you go check those out, but they are a very stable element in the genome and can be picked out pretty easily. Um, we see many gaps in repetitive regions, regardless of what high C you're using. Yeah, so, you know, repetitive regions are a challenge for NGS. They just are, right? That's one of the reasons long reads exist is to span those repetitive regions. You're not going to capture the confirmation, um, you know, but it really, what what micro-C offers in, 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 in a different aspect is where does that restriction motif appear on either end of uh, the, of the um, repetitive region? Right, and so uh, we, we see time and time again that when you zoom in on these repetitive regions, we typically get a little bit closer to the, the true start of the repetitive region because we're not biasing the data to where the restriction motif is. But repetitive regions are repetitive regions, and this is short read sequencing, so you're going to have the same problem no matter kind of how you slice that. Um, So I want to thank everybody for saying thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. Um, how good will micro C work for non-model organisms? That is a great question. So we have really modeled this. Uh, we validated this for mammalian cells. Um, we do have customer validated protocols working in various tissues and um, different species. Um, like I know we have one person that did it in a rabidop Arabidopsis uh, plant. Uh, we have a lot of uh, customers using fly um, as input and yeast. Um, so we have those protocols that we can share with you and also keep an eye out um, over the next year. We're really looking to um, include uh, different, different sample inputs into the validated um, bucket. Uh, so we can, we can reach more people who are wanting to do cool stuff on their particular tissue of interest. Is micro-C applicable to various cell lines? The answer is yes. We designed this to work on cell lines, so it will plug and play very easily. Uh, just answered the one for non-mammalian samples. Recommendations for trans contact detection. Okay, so we did talk about how trans interactions are, are a true thing that exists in the high sea space. Um, and how do you detect those from like the Brownian noise? Uh, there are a few ways to do this. Um, high C break finder is actually a, a way to do this, but you're going to be seeing as it's really designed to call as speed. There is no tool that I know of off the top of my head. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but I haven't seen one um, that will do this. But what I would recommend doing, and, and this is just me, is I would um, dump the contact matrix like a cool file into a, a upper sparse matrix or a bed PE of interaction. So you have uh, chromosome one, start end of, of the interaction, pro, uh, chromosome two, start end of the interaction, and then you have a contact count. I, I would do that across the whole genome. I would probably pick a large uh, or a decent bin size of maybe like, I don't know, 25 KB, 50 KB. And then, and then I would put import that into R or Python or whatever you want. And then I would ask, I would take only the rows where um, Chromosome one does not equal chromosome two. So now you have a bed PE file of all trans interactions. And since trans interactions should all behave the same, what you can do is just do a simple, what's my mean, what's my distribution of interactions? Where's my mean, where's my standard deviation? Then say, where do my interactions fall significantly different from the mean? And those are your significantly enriched interactions. So it would be a one-tail t-test because you're looking for enrichment rather than depletion. That's what I would do. There's probably more fancy stuff to do, but at a bare bones level, that's how I would ask that question. Okay, using micro-C, we can check interactions at 500 base feed. 
oh, can we detect at 500 basis? Yeah, absolutely. You just need more sequence data. Um, or it depends on how you're asking that question. If you're using a loop caller, you're going to need a lot more data. But if you already know where you're going to look, you can do something very similar to what I just said. With, um, but instead of taking all the trans, take all of the interactions that are associated with your, your viewpoint of interest and say, what is the most significantly enriched viewpoint or interaction associated with that at various size scales? So it's a very, I think, easy question to ask. Could I use nuclei instead of cells uh, to start as starting material? I, I don't want our support people to get mad at me. I think the answer is yes, um, but I would attend that Ask the Experts um, uh, webinar because they're, they're going to know. I know a lot about the data analysis and about the concept because I helped build some of this, but the ins and outs of the actual, I haven't touched a pipette in four years, five years almost. So I, I'm not the person to trust with that information. Um, thanks, yeah, the guitar collection has been going for a long time. There's actually some more over there that you can't see. Um, can you quantify the difference of loop contacts between two different samples? Yes, uh, comparative analysis. There are a lot of tools out there to do this. This is actually something that we're looking to build into EpiPipe this year is to provide um, customers with a means to do differential analysis and that will also go on the uh, read the docs page. So off the top of my head, there Fancy has a comparative function. Um, HiC Explorer has a comparative function where you can diff two different contact matrices. Um, then there is HiC Compare, which will diff two different contact matrices. If you are wanting to do this on loops, the way that you would do it would be create a master list of loops that has the shared and unique ones. Um, and then intersect the matrix to get a recount per loop for all your different conditions and kind of do a DE-seq analysis on those to say which one of those are enriched in, um, uh, in sample A, sample B, things like that. Um, why is mean tad size smaller than mean loop size? I think that was a typo on my end. Thank you very much for pointing that out. I do apologize for that. Um, yeah, my bad. Okay, I already talked about the minimum input. Is it challenging? Oh yeah, okay, so I, I did already kind of talk about uh, the fact that we've kind of done this a little bit in plans. I would uh, reach out to the uh, support group or your your sales rep in your region um, or attend that uh, micro -C webinar to think about different sample types. So I made it through all of the questions for the 50 folks still uh, hanging out. I really appreciate you um, staying on and I appreciate all of the questions I love the Q&A part's the most fun um, part of the webinars for me, hands down. So uh, again, thank you all very, very much. Um, and please, you know, Mariam would love to talk to you um, about the, the ins and outs of micro C and how to pipette it. And um, with that, I will end. And um, I hope you all have a great uh, rest of the, the day, evening, morning, whatever part of the world that you're in. So cheers and uh, thanks again.